Thank you very much. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Rosie for inviting me to speak to this conference. It's a great opportunity and an honor for me to be here. Um, so moving ahead to the topic of this, com of this presentation, um, I'm going to talk about the Iranian nuclear program. More specifically, I am going to make specific reference to the parameter, one of the parameters set in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Um, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is, has been recently unveiled by the P5 plus 1 and Iran, and it contains um, many provisions that are actually quite promising in terms of a working basis for a final agreement, but some outstanding barriers need to be overcome in order to, to create the, 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 the potential scenario for a, for a long-term and lasting solution. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Oops, sorry. So having moved to the next slide, we can see that the text of the framework agreement says that inspectors will have access uh, to the supply chain that supports Iran's nuclear program. Besides, a dedicated procurement channel for Iran's nuclear program will be established to monitor and approve on a case-by-case -case basis the supply, sale, or transfer to Iran of certain nuclear-related and dual-use material and technology. So, these statements are not very detailed and do not contain any technical issue uh, as far as it it is currently stated. However, some challenges that need to be addressed in the final agreement already can, can be already evidently uh, assessed. So these challenges are, um, for instance, who will be responsible for overseeing uh, the procurement channel? Which items will be controlled? How will controls be implemented? And ultimately, how will they be monitored? So with regards to who will be responsible for overseeing the procurement channel, um, because of some inherent limitations in the, in the international export controls regime, um, such as the nuclear suppliers group, certain activities, uh, most important ones actually, uh, I'm speaking now of implementation of controls, uh, enforcement of controls, or even licensing of transfers, these, these key activities in, in the nuclear procurement channel ultimately lie on national authorities of the exporters. So as the system stands, there is no uh, comprehensive framework for, um, for authorizing, for instance, n legitimate nuclear transfers to Iran. Um, however, perhaps precisely because of these limitations, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action also calls for a new UN uh, Security Council resolution which should create this new procurement channel. Well, this statement kind of entails two different, uh, two different elements. One is the selected forum for moving ahead in this, plan, uh, in this, in this, uh, in this issue. And the second one is um, certainly that of, uh, of potentially creating problems in terms of aligning the interests of the interested parties. Uh, however, because a new platform is set to be created, these seems to be foreseeing what will be the challenges and so potentially an ad hoc body will be created such as a, a security council committee for instance or a, including potentially a group of independent experts. Now moving on to the second challenge which is defining the list of controlled items. Uh, again this is a task which is easier said than done because uh, control lists despite they are despite their being defined by multilateral control regimes, they are not always consistently applied uh, when it comes to the national legislation. So there are loopholes in the system, and not to mention the fact that variation across jurisdiction can also demonstrate that there are different standards that governments set for themselves in terms of the level of control that should be applied to the transfer of uh, nuclear-related technology and goods. Another issue is definitely that of below control threshold, uh, because as the, as, the as the history of the nuclear program in Iran demonstrates, there is not only um, the need to control which the, those items that are either dual use in nature or potentially applicable to the, to the nuclear program, but also those that, as the system stands, are not controlled, such as some valves, some pressure transducers, or electro-pneumatic positioners, which are all items that have been functional to the development of the nuclear program in Iran. Another issue to take care of is certainly the, the, um, the implications that controls, uh, the, the way in which controls are implemented would have for the industry. And in this respect, 
industry actually plays a key role because of um, because of the fact that to to gain a better understanding of the commercial side of thing uh, as it is outlined for instance in one important document by the IAEA an outdated uh, quite an old one it was published in 1996 so if we look at if you look at that document we see a step by step model which um, which contains the phases of a nuclear of a standard commercial nuclear procurement program for any country and uh, this publication is quite extensive and detailed so it uh, in, it includes the phases from procurement planning to the closure of a supply contract. Now, trying to apply this standard model to the Iranian case, we see some more issues that arise, and the very interesting fact is that most of them uh, begin to be coming up from the very early phases. For instance, uh, in terms of procurement planning and specification of technical requirements, some challenges uh, as listed in the document. The document states that clear and unambiguous specifications should, should be set out from the very early stages. Now, if we put this in context and try to imagine whether Iran would be willing to disclose very, very technically uh, specific details, um, I believe this, this is quite inconsistent with the nuclear strategy that Iran has applied so far, which is one of ambiguity and hedging, potentially. So. Um, there, there needs to be a balance between what is desirable and what would be feasible in terms of realization. So, in the next phases, uh, those of the selection of the supplier and awarding contracts, for instance, again, we see that because of the, the development of the nuclear industry in the past decades, uh, the sector is no longer a US-dominated one. There is a range of candidates that might be able to supply products or services to Iran, and... Uh, they might be very legitimately selected by the by the by the relevant authority in the body, which at the at this stage is is not even present to be is not even there. So, depending on how the council resolution addresses this issue, the the relevant authority, we would then have to also realize which are the criteria for selecting the suppliers, and. That is relevant. That, that is very key indeed because the the vendor in this case have a very powerful role in influencing the policies and the overall trajectory of the nuclear uh, program of Iran. Um, another issue is definitely that of coordinating licensing, uh, licenses mechanism across different jurisdictions. Because as we mentioned before, there are different standards and different criteria, and also some, some of them are more stringent because of political reasons. So in order to, to kind of find a final agreement, we need to address this too. A key issue here is also that of ensuring the commitment of the industry, because one of the provision, uh, one of the paragraphs of the framework agreement states that if at any time Iran fails to fulfill its commitments, you and U.S. sanction will snap back into place. So you can imagine that if you want to commit to to a certain uh, supply contract, you would then try to adapt to the requirements of the of the situation. You will need to change some of your internal processes, etc. How can we ensure that the industry is willing to take this business opportunity if the volatility of the situation is so big? That is certainly something that needs to be addressed. Ultimately, the monitoring system has to be quite extensive and detailed because uh, it, it is key to provide assurance of the durability and the, and the uh, validity of the whole provision. So, Monitoring can be, can be seen in two levels at this stage. And uh, the first one is that of determining what, legitimately, what legitimate transfers are. Um, because, of course, assuming that a procurement channel is established, we would kind of need to re rethink philosophically how nuclear transfers to Iran are, are perceived. So there's going to be a shift between a sanction regime to a legitimate uh, procurement channel. And that is definitely a complicated shift to make, also considering that the time frame for sanctions has not been agreed yet. Um, the second level for monitoring is that of auditing declared end uses. So uh, potential measures to undertake are those of expanding the IAEA mandate and the resources, of course, because as uh, the IAEA has previously mentioned, the, they already have um, they are allotted limited resources, so if demand has to be increased, also the kind of level of, 
of funding and who is going to be responsible for implementing these, uh, these activities is going to be addressed. Then, in order to, 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 inform, to have a well-informed assessment of the, of the activities that the Iranian government is acting, we would also need to have a, a high level of intrusion, which is quite unlikely to be agreed by, by both parties. So this is also something that needs to be, uh, needs to be looked with great care. So to sum it up, um, there are challenges that spread across a multitude of, um, of, of different uh, perspectives. Um, they can be summed as the limitation of the multilateral export control regimes. Um, because of that, the need to align the interests of uh, the involved parties in the UN Security Council, which is not necessarily going to be an easy task because of some of the problems that also Thomas has addressed before. Um, Defining a control list is also going to be complicated, um, as much as the, the, the issue of tackling below, below control threshold procurement. Not to mention the fact that Iran has demonstrated quite a good ability to avoid controls on, uh, on its nuclear program in the past. Um, there are also many implications for commercial nuclear procurement practices, which are uh, a key consideration that government has to make as well as determining what is legitimate nuclear-related transfer and verifying auditing declarant users. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I've been able to stay in the 10 minutes, and I'll leave the stage to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Michele.